we're on. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here yet again. I want to save just a couple of minutes. Uh, we won't go around the room with three introductions for the third and fourth time. For the most part, we know who we are and the stakeholders that we represent. Uh, I think this is a meeting to be open and honest and transparent. This is a meeting that I'm not sure I've been looking forward to, but I have been looking forward to. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your input over the last couple of months, and obviously staff folks were much longer you know, post post fire when we had the, the property subcommittee meeting and going through the feasibility study, which took place into this particular committee and hiring of that SMA, uh, going through the schematic designs. Uh, we were able to send that out to the estimator and got the estimate back uh, at the end of September, first week of October, and uh, I will again. I, I, I've said this every month. Uh, I want to publicly thank SMA. I think the news that will be shared this afternoon, uh, whether it's shocking or not, uh, is not the best of news as far as a financial standpoint. Um, but I again want to thank both of you specifically for just working through that and, and not running to the hills to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Uh, and I think from that moment to today, I think there's been some more positive, productive, and professional conversations about how do we make this work uh, within the budget that we have. So uh, I do want to thank both of you for trying to find ways to, to make that happen. Uh, but with that said, I, I know we have probably like an hour and a half before we have to get ready for the board meeting. Uh, I think there might be a lot of uh, discussion and, and some input from uh, all of you. This will obviously be the first time that you see you know, what the numbers are. Uh, I want to give both of you an opportunity to kind of walk through where it's been since then. And hopefully give myself a, a better uh, footing to stand on this evening when I present to the board. Uh, just as a building committee, so you're aware, uh, my hope is that this evening I report basically what we talked about today uh, to the full board of trustees. Uh, they are very service level aware of what we're going to hear today. Uh, so I'll, I'll give the full report uh, this evening. And uh, my hope is to then spend the next month working with the board uh, so they will be prepared to make an official vote at the November meeting, uh, which I am going to be advocating to the full board that we bump their meeting up a week. Uh, so I'm advocating for a November 14th Board of Trustees meeting uh, for them to have an official vote on how do we move forward? You know, what is their option as a Board of Trustees? Uh, what do they want to authorize me to move forward on? So that's kind of where we're at. Okay, so how we move forward with it. as this committee, you know, I, I want to continue to lean on all of you with your expertise, a lot of recommendations, decision making as far as how do we make this project work within the, the scope of the money. And I haven't been shy about the budget. I, I've, I've said this from day one. Uh, a $6 million budget is very tight for this. Uh, and how do we make it work? So, without further ado, the two all stars of the team. It was like a setup there. <laughs> Um, all right, well, um, nice to be with you all. Um, you know, we have some work to do. I'll just, I'll just start with that. Um, still remain committed and excited about the project. However, um, there's not great news to share with the cross. So I'm going to hold off on sharing the numbers for a minute. Um, but the agenda today is, of course, the bulk of which will be uh, discussing what we learned from the schematic design cost and estimating process. Um, we have um, also done the next step with respect to uh, life cycle cost analysis for the three systems, mechanical systems, that were um, considered for the project, and then we'll talk about next steps. So just to back up a little bit, um, at last month's meeting, we continued to have a good discussion about the needs of the program, and um, we did arrive at um, you know, a pretty, I, I think, lean design, um, but that also, you know, meets the needs of, um, of the program. Um, and just to reiterate what we uh, included as the basis of design for the numbers that you, you will be seeing for the project. Um, so <clears throat> we'll call it 10,000 gross square foot uh, program. Um, we never had included this greenhouse square footage as was consistent with the feasibility study. Um, and in that 10,000 square feet, there are the three classrooms, simulator room for which the, the school has received um, funding uh, for the simulators, two shops, inclusive the climbing tower, which again also grant sponsored uh, there to some degree, uh, the head house that would connect 
to the greenhouse and uh, teacher's office as well as ancillary space, toilet rooms, storage, etc. Uh, we had all gone in with um, the hope that this would be 100% uh, cross laminated timber uh, construction, um, that we would be able to uh, fund a new greenhouse, or at least be estimated one. Um, we did go in with the base, um, the, again, basis of design um, assumption with the air source ARF system uh, for mechanicals for the building, and we um, assumed to design, bid, build, delivery uh, methodology. So, with that, here are the numbers for that project. Um, you can see uh, direct cost is six million. Uh, the site work, uh, 1.1. Uh, the new greenhouse, um, 389. Um, again, the, the direct cost um, is 7.6 6 million dollars. On top of that, and I think crowd here is mostly familiar with um, you know the additional considerations um, want to at this in this schematic design is very early in design so 10% assumption um, reserved for design contingency things changing um, our estimator uh, Ann Fogarty um, uh, used uh, a percentage of 2.25 to escalate to the date that we would be bidding the project in the spring of 2024 so that again adds um, adds close to a million dollars dollars to the construction, and then on top of that are the projects. So bonds, which uh, again our estimator includes line items, general conditions, general requirements, building permit. We are hopeful that the city of Northampton will show some mercy, but otherwise that would have been another one percent or you know hundred thousand dollars. Um, insurances and overhead and profit. So that brings total construction cost to $10.8 million. Soft costs. Then we've got the other list, the, uh, the things that aren't built, but um, do have to pay your architect and your OPM. And all of those investigations that we've done, um, the geotechnical work, the borings, um, you know, uh, survey, all of those, and plus there is uh, some um, amount of the owner's contingency for changes that you might want to make further down the line uh, in that soft cost number which um, Craig and his company provided to us at 1.5. So that does uh, total up to a total project cost of over $12 million. So, anyone want to answer questions or I can keep going with some of the things we've been doing since then. I, is there shock? Is there awe? Is there disappointment? <laughs> A little bit. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, additional work we've been doing. So actually, that um, the date on the estimate of 10-11 was already um, reviewed with the design team and some changes were made. But we did um, have them estimate several alternates. Um, so we did want them to consider uh, construction manager at risk, which Craig had introduced at the last meeting, um, that adds cost. Um, we had always intended to consider um, the building as partial CLT, um, as well as a fully steel construction uh, building, um, relocating house instead of going all new um, and also say 56,000 um, and then we did estimate the um, alternate mechanical systems ground source which I think, again this group is pretty excited about as will be does add a considerable amount to the bottom line uh, wood pellet boiler um, again these are both in lieu of the air source system that was the basis of design those both had costs and then the greenhouse, we have some options there with respect to mechanical systems. So what's in the basis of design is the electric heaters. So if we were to consider a biomass boiler for the greenhouse, again, and add 160 or ground source heat pump, um, again, larger number of 739. 
uh, with respect to exterior cladding, the basis of design was a metal, metal panel system, which was the, the school's um, request and desire as being um, most easily maintained. Um, so, we, But we did also consider fiber cement board or hardy board, um, and that would save 191,000 cedar shake, um, something that I know John Parrott was pretty interested in, um, that would save 153,000. Um, we did want to look at the green roof, not for occupancy, but to see if providing a green roof over the, the classroom wing would also help save on some of the retention um, systems that Berkshire Design Group has been designing. And it is an app, so I think we know the way of the green roof at this point. Um, we had some demolition scenarios that we wanted to play out, and I don't know, maybe Matt, can you kind of talk through the diagram? Yeah, so our, our base assumption was that we were going to be taking down the entirety of the existing building E as part of the project. The existing barn would stay, um, but the building would come down, and that would be sort of our, our starting point just to understand what that cost would be. Um, we then looked at a couple different scenarios in terms of uh, partial demolition of that building, so leaving some of it as remaining and taking down some of it. Uh, but I'm sorry, when I say that uh, we're going to take down all of it. Um, I think we would start off at a point where the existing foundations um, are always going to be going away, even if we meet the rest of the building. Uh, that's, that's sort of step one that goes without saying if we're going to keep some of it. Uh, beyond that, uh, we looked at a scenario that uh, left just the, uh, the, the garage building, um, which is in yellow there. Um, and that was uh, part of the, the, the larger of the savings that we Sorry, smaller of the savings. If we were left with just that that one piece remaining, uh, there's only a savings of fifteen thousand dollars or so from it, just because it's a small piece of whatever is remaining there. Um, if we were to think of keeping uh, both the blue section and the yellow section, that's where we have the potential of saving the two forty-five, or it would still be that demolition again of the existing foundations, the portion of the building that been burned down. Um, but there's still some considerable savings if we left essentially the yellow and the blue sections. So you get the garage, you get the existing classroom, uh, the head house, and the green houses. Red has been burned. <laughs> yes. um, you know, and then um, moving along, we had some interior um, uh, considerations for alternates, um, you know, really taking out um, linoleum floor covering and, and instead just doing painted concrete. That's a significant savings of 119. Um, 9B was actually a request by um, the person at DCR that we spoke with, um, again, trying to promote use of wood products. Um, I think he was interested in knowing that number, so perhaps some donations might be able to offset um, the number, but the number is significant. So instead of you know using linoleum and uh, going to wood flooring, that's an ad of 76. Maybe just to be clear on that one, that was just for the classroom areas. We're not suggesting wood floor oh, in yeah. the shops, <laughs> yeah. uh, but <laughs> in the classrooms itself, is that's what the value is, the $77,000. Yeah. Um, wall construction um, option um, in lieu of CLT backup, I don't know what, what, the, what was offered. So on the exterior walls, you have your cladding material, you have your insulation, then you have essentially the structure of the exterior wall. Um, so typical construction is maybe metal studs, exterior metal studs with some drywall finish on the interior. Um, actually, our base scenario here was actually using CLT panels, so wood laminated panels as that backup exterior wall. So when you're inside the space, you'd actually be seeing the wood um, on the panels. We showed a precedent image um, a, a couple meetings back that had a similar type of finish. It, it's industrial. We think it was completely fitting for the shop spaces themselves. Um, this. Um, this savings actually would reflect going to the metal studs and the drywall as in the interior finish and we would put up say plywood up until about eight feet in the shop just to provide a sort of ring of durability down in this sort of impact area of the shops. So that's a significant savings as well, 114,000. Um, and then we did want to look at um, use of wood curtain wall, and, you know, again, in a wood structure, that's an add. Um, we had um, looked at all aluminum windows that are going to aluminum clad in lieu of all aluminum, and that's a, a small savings, but 
certainly worth considering, and um, we have the alternating tread devices to access the storage um, mezzanine, storage lots, um, and we did want to get a number for um, a more regular stair, um, and that would be an add of 63,000. So, um, you know, playing out some of these numbers, the things that are kind of color coded are it's you can't take both where there's deducts, right? It's just one or the other. And so we did, um, we did do that. Um, we, you know, we, we took, um, you know, uh, we wanted to consider the partial CLT building still to see the impacts of accepting several of those deduct alternates. Um, you know, that at the end of the end, assuming that, um, you know, we keep the existing greenhouse, not provide a new one, um, you know, that does yield um, quite a bit of savings from the 12 to a 10, um, but again, still greatly uh, more than, than the, the school has um, currently in hand for funds. And if you look to um, go to the all steel construction option, Again, more savings, but still not getting us there. So that, that was some of the um, you know, uh, exercises that we went through to kind of see where, where and how this would all play out. Can you just highlight again the 1011 estimate? A couple of the things that we did add in there from the last meeting, so the lower and the fish floor and the wall height, I think it was. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the first estimate <coughs> I think came out on 10.4. Um, and so we did, we, we always reconcile with our cost estimator and sit down and do a close review and we're seeing where the numbers were, it's, we said, okay, let's, let's take a closer look at the ceiling height in the classrooms. I don't remember where we started at, um, but, you know, still certainly ample, but we did bring down um, <coughs> the ceiling height and then by extension, the exterior wall in that section of the building. Um, and then the, the other thing we were able to do um, with Berkshire Design Group was, remember they were still sort of catching up to us a month ago, and so now that they're definitely more embedded in the project, um, felt more comfortable um, bringing the finished floor elevation down a foot, which is again something that we've been talking about um, with respect to the amount of fill that we need to bring in. So we were able to do that in that week between the first estimate and the second estimate. So again, we, we have not been complacently accepting that number. We've been fighting it back as hard as we could, but we, we can only do so much without participation of you all. Um, so, so yep. Question, difference between GCs, which is general conditions, miscellaneous stuff, the contractor's cost or say run the project and support the project. Mm -hmm. So what are general requirements? The last time, and we had a had a good definition. I think uh, things like um, fencing around the project. Um, well, I would consider that part of the general, general conditions. Yeah, when I did my yeah. general conditions, that I didn't have two line items. I had one line item called general conditions. Yeah. There. So yeah. I'm just a little confused here. That's, it's always a point of confusion. Different GCs put different things in those yeah, piles. In different piles. Right. And I think the estimator has sort of a, a standard set of assumptions mm -hmm. that they're used for 149 construction. And so mm -hmm. while, while we could question it, um, I think that it's always sort of a given in terms of what the total percentage increase is going to be mm -hmm. on the overall project. I think the difference between the GCs and the GRs here is that you can see the GRs are at 2.25% overall. The GCs are, is in terms of the manpower that's brought to the project um, from a supervision standpoint, it's really tied to the duration of the project. And so I will say they've been a little bit conservative in terms of assuming that we have a 12-month construction timeline in front of us. Um, there's some argument to say, well, can you get it done faster? And if you can get it done faster, then at $120,000 a month, you can find some savings there. But it's tough for us as the designers and the estimators to be able to say, yes, we can do that faster because <coughs> we're the ones designing, not the ones building. I asked the same question, and uh, I just did a quick Google search. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this particular website, some examples for general requirements uh, would be plan reproduction of photography, surveying and field engineering services, 
field operation support such as labor, storage, equipment, well, tools, barricades, cleanups, job site conditions such as security, roads, lay down, toilet signs, project safety such as equipment and supplies, energy or environmental control such as power, water, heat, cooling, fire protection. All right, but Tom said it's where, which pile you put the money in, but the put the cost in. Um, How does this compare to some other buildings in the area? This is like $1,200 a square yeah, foot. That's insane. I'm not a general contractor, but I've been in business long enough to, to know, and that surprises me to see this 1200 square foot or 10,000 square foot building. Is there any other buildings similar to this that have been out for bid that are under construction that are running the same the same way? That's just mind boggling at 1200. I don't know how you feel. I, about no, that. I totally agree. It's it's insane. I mean, no, the costs have escalated that that much. This this isn't really a fancy building. Um, it's not fancy. Half of it is shop. Half finishes the right, there. right. There's there's no bells and whistles. And no, the finishes there's no there. bells and whistles. Exposed structure and there's hung ceiling. <laughs> That's what we have for. Yeah, I'm just blown place. away by that number. Well, am I right that if we go with the the average cost here, the the middle cost at five million divided by ten thousand square feet, that gets us in the five hundred per square foot of construction. That doesn't for the account, building. For the building. It doesn't count the site work. Right. So five hundred for construction of the building seems reasonable to me. It's more than I want it to be. But you're losing the greenhouse. You're not you're not gaining the greenhouse. Maybe it is what it is. It just surprises me that it's that much. I, I felt the same way. And Tom, I think that was the, the first time I was able to sort of conceptualize it was, you know, looking at the construction costs, yeah, you're in that five to $600 range. Um, I just can't, I, I'm still having a hard time with the site work. You know, I, I don't want to make fun of dirt, but it's a million dollars worth of dirt, basically. Um, I, I know we have drainage and okay, I'm overly simplifying it. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's, this is why I've been losing sleep since the end of September, is how, there's no way, uh, and I wanted to thank you, Helen, for highlighting how we were able behind the scenes, that, that estimate dropped the cost a little bit, dropping the, the finished flooring by a foot. And you know the debate we had here within this committee about that finished floor and, and the aesthetics of, of the building around the campus. Dropping it one foot, which some people may feel is extreme, um, only netted about $100,000. That figure, the site work was over to, uh, 1.2 million when it first came back. So again, we, we make a decision behind the scenes that I think doesn't really break with the entire design, but we're only netting $100,000. We have to net another $6 million to make this project work. That's where I'm stressing, uh, just to be honest with all of you. Maybe, Jim, to answer your question, just in terms of comps, we're happy to go back to the cost estimator and see what they have projects in the area coming in at. I think it, at some level there's, a, there's efficiency of scale or economy of scale that can be found in larger projects where we're still paying for some of these things on a much smaller building size. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason for well, the That's premium. what I'm saying is to compare it to something similar to 10 or 12,000 square feet. That, that may be tough to find in terms of public construction at the school of this size. Um, Within, within the area, but we'll ask the question and sort of see. Uh, we can also ask the question of some of the other SMEers that we work with, not on this project, and they'll be happy to share the information in terms of where bids have come back at. I'm going to go really out on the limb and put Mr. Smith on the spot, seeing what he's done on campus with his crew. Could we take this project on in-house? If you want to, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't mind seeing it before I retire. Um, and, and I no joking, um, serious, and there's real seriousness here. Uh, how are we going to get this to affordability? Okay. So let's go to the next there's slide. <laughs> so uh, again, we continue to talk as a team um, uh, over the last week or so, um, and the next line of thinking is around consideration of a prefab metal building uh, construction. So um, again, this has not been cost estimated, hence the uh, asterisk. Um, and this is all pretty much 
late breaking as of last week. Um, I know Matt can talk a little bit about um, a conversation that was had with uh, um, someone who represents a fabricator of prefab metal buildings. Um, but we're starting to look at this again from you know a construction methodology standpoint. So we're hearing a prefab metal uh, solution could be from 200 to $300 a square foot. So we started <coughs> plugging that number against an assumption that if we are not uh, getting a new greenhouse, we're going to retain the existing greenhouse and headhouse. So, um, you know, decreasing the square footage of the project. So those middle two columns look at um, decreasing um, the building size by eliminating the headhouse. Um, and then the last column takes out the head house and a classroom. Now, again, not great for how the program would need to function, um, but we are just trying to look for ways forward to uh, get this project to be more affordable. One thing that um, schoolhouse construction has done, um, you know, is to say, well, if it's a metal building approach, um, the soft cost would would decrease a bit. Um, again, all of this needs to be played out more. It also assumes a reduction in the owner's contingency, I think from 10 to 7%. Um, but um, we do want to continue to explore this option. Um, we have not tackled the floor plan again to see what the impacts would be to shrinking the building. Um, and of course, whatever we would do, we'd be thinking about, you know, in the future, how could you marry a future greenhouse to uh, a new building. So it does bring the cost down significantly. Um, so again, the far left column goes back to where we started with the basis of design with some added some modifications of the 12, um, and then considers, um, you know, again, uh, uh, not um, fully estimated data that we're receiving, but um, what, what the numbers might look like with this approach. And from my, my viewpoint and conversation I've had you know, with SMMA is you know, back the demo cost, we already saw the potential savings if we don't take down the current garage, classroom, headhouse, greenhouse. Uh, and again, I think I've said it here uh, on the record, I'm not necessarily advocating that separate learning spaces is, is ideal. But financially, if we're not going to take those buildings down, can we continue to use them? Uh, so is there a way to build the new building and the, the combination of the new building and the existing building meet the same schedule that was in the feasibility study, which is what we're trying to solve the problem. So um, if we don't create the new head house, but we maintain the old head house, at least we have a head house. Um, that, that's sort of my mindset. Not ideal, but again, we have nothing if we can't meet a budget. Um, and I just want to again hammer home some of those costs. You'll see, like the GCs, you know, that that 1.4. Without going to the estimator, we don't know what that. You know, but I think just a logical frame of mind, some of those costs would come down because just the methodology of building would be a little bit more simplified on site. So there might be some savings there. So. Now, is that putting a metal building on the site that we're looking at already? Yes. yes. Yeah. Would it be helpful to give a little bit of description of what the prefab metal building is, sort of what it would look like if people aren't familiar with that necessarily? So, um, prefab metal structure is sort of what it implies um, that there's two components of the building that end up being fabricated off site and brought in, sort of a kit of parts type approach. Um, so, it's primarily the structural frame. Um, as well as the exterior skin, so exterior walls, and as well as the roof. Um, and the reason that they're able to get cost efficiencies there is that it really is like working with a kit of parts. It's not like Lego kit of parts, but um, there's efficiencies in terms of how they design the structure that are different than if it's a custom design frame for um, a new structure. So they've been able to get those efficiencies into their system. Um, on 
The exterior skin, it, it greatly simplifies what that exterior skin is. There's really two ways of building it. One is just a single corrugated metal panel exterior, um, and then there's insulation, um, so essentially bag insulation that is exposed on the interior of that metal skin. That's sort of the simplest. It's actually probably not what we would prefer. The second option is an insulated metal panel. Uh, so there's companies like Centria out there that make these um, single skin metal panels that have steel on the outside or aluminum, um, as well as the inside, and they spray foam inside those panels. Um, and it's sort of an integral finish on the exterior and the interior, durable as well as provides the energy code required um, R values, insulated values, to the exterior wall. Similar on the roof, typically the roofs are a standing seam metal, um, similar to the corrugated on the walls. Um, and then you also have the options in terms of um, what that, that roof assembly is going to be in terms of the, the top of the building. Um, and so through the use of those, the combined structure and then the exterior skin is really where you find the majority of the savings. And when we talk about prefab metal building, that's really what we're talking about. They are, they're generally put up um, a little bit quicker than traditional steel as well in terms of the crews that come uh, to do that. And so there's efficiency there as well as on the labor side. From everything else on the interior of the building, it is fit out like traditional construction. So there's still going to be drywall walls and everything that we would be used to, hollow metal doors uh, and frames on the inside. Um, so it's not going to look or feel like something different on the inside of it. It's really more the exterior of the building where it has a different feel to it. Um, we did have a good conversation with one of the prefab metal contractors that uh, Schoolhouse had some familiarity with. They had only done work in New Hampshire and Connecticut, uh, which we, after we were sort of talking with them, that became apparent. And the cost of construction outside the state of Massachusetts, outside of our mass public construction requirements, is a lot less uh, than it is here. So they were telling us some numbers that were just, they, they were great to believe. We could have just gone with that, and then that solves the entire budget problem. But it's just, it's not the reality of that we're looking for. So. Instead, we're going down this path, I think as Hell has been describing, that we still need to look for different approaches to sort of sum up, um, to really tackle the overall budget challenge that we have. But we do think that prefab metal buildings is, is going to be a large part of the solution in terms of getting us, just because of the efficiencies and because we can still provide the skin, um, the, the exterior envelope of the building that's required um, and necessary. Do you have a sense of how much redesign you'll have to do to the floor plans to accommodate skin so I think for the skin not a lot the only difference in terms of the skin is that the, the columns are generally deeper off the exterior yeah. wall because it's like a it's like an extruded um, sort of deep W flanger eye shape that goes throughout so you have some projections that come off the wall in the shops but generally those are going to be at the column line so they're not going to be like in the middle of a, of a bay or anything like that and you can keep your bay width you think or, or get bigger actually because it steel frame so we were always planning for wood in terms of the framing so we had like a 12 foot spacing in terms of our structural bay steel is going to get much wider it could probably double that we would just go to the 24 um, and probably it's a single frame that's going to be able to span from one side of the building to the other i think that's some of the why the efficiencies show up as well is that we don't have a lot of columns and footings that are dropping on the interior of the building um, it's why you see a lot of times prefab metal buildings are used for long span spaces like gymnasiums, hockey rinks, um, that type of space. Even um, like agricultural barn spaces, they're, they're used a lot for. Um, where I thought you were going with the question in terms of the amount of redesign associated with potentially taking out these program spaces. If we're thinking about not including a head house in one classroom, as the play is laid out right now, there's sort of the two corners of the building, op diagonally opposite corners, in terms of where we would sort of be taking bites out of the apple. Um, and I think I made the analogy earlier today, it's sort of like a little Tetris block that you end up with, uh, which we would want to try to sort of push the ends back together. So there may be a little bit of shifting that we have to do, but we don't think it's, it's an overall redesign. It's really taking the components that we know work internally and sort of shifting them together. So if you can sort of do that in your mind in terms of taking out those two corners maybe um, and then sort of compressing the pieces together, that, that's where we would be going, I think, if we end up with a, uh, a redesign oh, effort as well. Thank you, Annie. There you go. Uh, hopefully be aligned. Right. Something along those lines. So there would be some questions that we'd have to come back and probably talk through with James and Mark to make sure that we're making the right assumptions, but the goal would still be to be 
is aligned to that at the initial sort of vision and, and configuration of the different spaces as we can. Does the uh, prefabricated metal building implicate the uh, VRF systems or energy systems in any way? It, it shouldn't in a, in a big picture way. Um, I would say the, the one area that may impact things a little bit is that the prefab metal buildings are inherently a little less robust in terms of their insulation performance. The energy code actually has a specific set of criteria for prefabricated metal buildings. So it's, it's not prescriptive in terms of meeting if we were just building from scratch with all the, as we currently designed it in terms of the parts and pieces. It's not to say that they're leaky buildings, it's just that the, the construction approach is inherently different. Um, so it, it accounts for some of the inefficiencies. So if there's an incremental drop in that exterior insulation R value, um, there might be a little bit more um, capacity that we have to build into the system firsthand, um, and then again, incrementally additional operational costs in terms of keeping the energy in the building after heating or cooling. Okay. Uh, just one more. I became more receptive to this option. Uh, one of the manufacturers out there that the link was given to me was Kirby. You have time tonight, you know, just Google Kirby. You know, some of the, the examples out there were fascinating. It's not the prefab metal building I found of like 20 years ago. Uh, if you didn't know you were at the Kirby website, you wouldn't know there's a metal prefab building, honestly, that you were looking at. But one question I have uh, for Will would be the procurement process. It's a concern I have, I haven't shared this publicly yet. But if we go down this road and we want to purchase a metal prefab building, I think the understanding is there's a pretty hefty deposit. How do we deal with procurement? If we're required to give a deposit, but we have no goods in hand yet, how do we get around that and still follow all the regulations? I'm not sure you have an answer now, or think about it, look into it. I don't, but I'll look into it. it, it Deposits it's are always tough, just <laughs> yeah. because we can't pay for goods or services I'm rendered. I don't know that I have the answer right now, though I know that we are encountering this same exact challenge on different projects right now, because other manufacturers that are out there in the world in terms of the aluminum curtain wall, things that have extremely long lead times and high dollar values, uh, manufacturers are just right now demanding that there are deposits or they're not going to bid on a project. Um, and so we, we, on public construction projects, this is just what we're running into more and more. It can be for bleachers, it can be for curtain wall. Um, it, it, it has been coming up again, so we can we can look at those other projects yeah. and just sort of figure out what the sort of you requisition approval mechanism is. Show that it's storage that they like they have mm -hmm. the materials in a place. There's a whole way to do storage, yeah, right. and then they so you do a deposit for the materials, and then they add labor, and then you pay for the labor once the thing is built. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, the other piece we're you know trying to work with here is the, the grant requirements. I mean, so I, I, think I, I have another clear value. Um, I, I kept hearing June of 24. I think it's actually June of 25. We have two grants. Okay. Uh, we have a smaller grant and a larger grant. The smaller grant, we've, we've been able to use up to $600,000 out of that grant for facility upgrades. We wrote that particular grant for the 600000 for some of our animal science upgrades the renovation of the animal science building, the construction of what Tim's been working on, uh, that 600000 has been spent by June of 24. The larger grant, which was the $5 million grant, yeah, $5 million grant, where we can use $3.5 million out of that grant for facilities, we've targeted that for this particular project. That is June of 25. So That's much we can better than 24. <laughs> And you're confident with that? I saw it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, my other, might be a good segue, but I want to really try to explain to the board tonight is that um, kind of what I just shared. So we have maybe this 3.5 million, we have another year to spend it. Okay. The timeline, we have to spend that money by June of 25. I still really think we need to have this building done by June of 25. So the state says you spend your money, you have a finished product. Uh, for us to go through the process, and I'm open to the idea of continuing to fundraise and find money, the longer we wait, 
you'll see the schedule from Helen. Uh, we're not going to have a building done in time if we really not waste more time, but if we spend more time in, through discussion, I think it's time to make some decisions and take some action. So if you want, I'm not sure if the schedule is up next, but. I just have a question about the classroom. So how many, you guys have two classrooms now? Well, yeah. I mean. One in the space. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But that was what was there yes, before. Yes, two, two classrooms. Yeah, I have pretty big concerns about having it be one classroom. No, no, oh, no. no there's three in the new building. <coughs> Plus, the simulator, Plus the simulator Plus the simulator classroom. room. They're looking at taking one of those three out because they're going to keep, they're looking at keeping the one that's existing. Oh, 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 oh. So you could still have the same. There would like, still be three classrooms okay, okay, okay. and the simulator space. It's just okay. one of the new ones would be taken away because the old one will be you still use that. Yeah, gotcha. Right? And that plays into my question. What do we, if, if that's the road we go down and we're looking at keeping that building, have we looked at the cost to, are we going to have to bring it up to code, have to fix it so that we don't have all the issues that are wrong with it? Because that's, in my mind, there's a lot that needs to be fixed in there to bring it up. And that, and how much of a saving is that? Or is that a, another project for another day? And to emphasize that, I always feel like when you, cut off a little corner of a building, it never nets you the savings, especially when you look over the long term that you're hoping for. So. Back to the first question, um, what are the costs involved in if we maintain that building? Um, my understanding is if we don't try to be built off of the existing building, there's no need to necessarily bring it up to code in of itself. Uh, I'll get back to that point because I asked the same question earlier today. Uh, as far as bringing it up to the 21st century, which I also asked earlier today, um, <laughs> I, I know James, you want to keep the, the 1970s wood paneling, but we can discuss yeah. that. Uh, if it stays in that building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that is a, a second phase uh, to try to bring that. If that building is going to be made for the next who knows how many years, I'm with you. I'd love to modernize it at some point. Um, my concern, I asked the, the question, the, the, the nuclear, nuclear option, if we can't even afford any new building whatsoever, and do we have to do a metal prefab extension or you know rebuild off what, what we lost, but reconstruct it via the metal prefab route? Now we're bringing the entire thing up to code. The other issue is we haven't talked about the site, the current site. There's potential contamination in the ground that if we begin to demo or work on or rebuild, now we're dealing with mitigating those issues, which is a, a cost. If we leave it as is, we don't have to deal with those costs. So there's a savings there. So it's a very fine line of what we do. Uh, I think rationally I'm thinking it's just cheaper. Let's just rebuild off of it and bring it up cut. There's costs that I think I'm not seeing if we go down that road. Because my, my concern is there's a lot wrong with that building that needs to be addressed if we're going to continue to use it. Yes. Um, heating system is one. Leaking roof, which I know we were going to fix. It was scheduled to before we got the fire. Um, and there, there's other things, but I, I see, I don't want to say I, I like the idea, but I see that, that we could bring it up, but I think there's a lot more to it than I, we're I seeing. Agree. Yeah. I don't think we can't touch it for the next... 15 years and just right. think it's going to be fine. Like that. I think we need some attention. How quickly? Yeah. What can I do? I think the other consideration, just I, I think I'm thinking along the same lines, but not just from a cost standpoint, but from an educational standpoint, right? If you're renovating that building, you guys are in the building right now, you would actually have to be displaced from the building to find some other place for instruction for the course of probably the year. Um, it's still going to take the time to sort of go through the different steps, the remediation especially, in terms of getting that out there. I mean, I know, I, I would assume that we would put up the new building, move into that before we did any renovation for that. And then, then we're not really displaced fully. Right. We could probably work around that. The issue is we would have need access to the greenhouse. Right. But if the greenhouse doesn't have heat and electric and because it's being renovated, then we are down to one greenhouse. Um, and half of our curriculum of the greenhouse. So 
it, it is a, there is might be a workaround there where okay we're not going to be displaced because we don't need the third classroom immediately. Yeah. And we would maybe use our new building as the head house versus the existing head house, and you know, we might be able to make things work if that was the way we had to go. Um, but we'd still kind of need that greenhouse. Really. The nuclear nuclear option. <laughs> if we weren't building a new building whatsoever, and we're going to try to renovate and add on, now you're displaced. Right? Correct. That, that whole right. So, <coughs> ideally, I, I would love to have a new building of, of some level. Right. Move you into that new building and then deal with what we need to deal with. If we have the funds available, or at least come up with a game plan, uh, this is what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. right. Ideal world, you could ideally do those renovations over a summer, even if it was sort of the, the more minor in right. nature renovations, mm -hmm. and then yeah. hopefully not even affect the school year right. schedule. In the longer term, if you end up having two spaces, a new building, and the, is that going to um, affect staffing levels? Like, are you going to need a teacher's aide, for example, permanent, to be able to oversee so, having students yeah, so long in two term, separate spaces? Right, so long term, you know, we've been talking about horticulture similar to animal science, where we really want to focus on the concentrations and, and offer more of the concentrations. So, um, once we cross that threshold, we've been talking about a third instructor anyhow, which is why when we were designing this building, we wanted to have that third classroom mm -hmm. on top of the, the simulator space. Uh, so I think that day will come at some point. And, and I think the way it would go if we kept the structure with the greenhouse, that would be the greenhouse floor culture mm -hmm. concentration would be in that building there. and then. Mm -hmm. You know, ninth and tenth, and then the other concentrations would be down below. So we can make that would be an easy way to make it work. We just, again, it, it, it's a little harder for the student, um, keep an eye on all the students and stuff. But we would just go do greenhouse stuff. You know, versus. from a supervision standpoint, you can. I think we have precedent already on campus with the other work we have down back. So the animal science building is the animal science related classrooms, teacher space which is separate from the new building that is going up with the companion animal concentration, which is different than the MS barn that has the new pocket pet lab. So they have different physical spaces that they have to sort of manage. Uh, again, is it ideal? I'm not saying it's ideal, but... Um, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Could a metal prefab building actually be constructed faster? Yes. yes. It will go up faster. Yes. The, the, that one manufacturer that we had a phone, the phone call with last Friday, um, I just some quick notes. Um, he claims from shop approval design to delivery is about 16 weeks. Now, how long does it take on site to put it up? But, um, and. Um, Here's the building. When you put it up, the only thing that we would notice between your design and our design is the aesthetics from the outside, for the most part. When you say your design and our design, you're afraid of like the prefab metal. Your design that you already just, have, yep. okay, to a prefab metal. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at more block structure. It's not going to have those that, that extra levels with the windows and. Okay. Potentially. Um, it, it, yeah. I oh, mean, okay. there's, there's so good. There's going to be more savings okay. if we went to, yes, a, a simpler sort of shed right. roof, um, maybe what everyone is more familiar with as a metal building. No one has said, though, and when we asked the question, um, whether or not we could sort of have sort of a single frame that does something like this and comes back down, um, the manufacturer we're speaking with is like, well, if, if you pay us to do some of the pre-construction work, then we can tell you that. Um, we can go directly to the manufacturers and we can work with them because we've done that before. Um, but so I don't think it's out of the question, it's just, It'll increase the the dollar per square right. foot cost if we're doing something more custom. So it's just trying to figure that. Out. But the other but, but teaching wise and use of the space is not really going to impact what we do. It it we'll should have the basic same layout. We'll yes. have the basic same space. That's the goal. The only thing that I the other part of thing about is the climbing tower. Right. So um, so we asked about the climbing tower. I think there's two ways to think about it and handle it. One is that you imagine that the volume of the entire building just gets taller to be able to accommodate that climbing activity anywhere. Um, and that, that's probably the simplest route. Again, we're going to try and talk with the manufacturer and just understand, because you're adding a certain amount of additional square footage 
it, it's not tremendous. Uh, right. and there's more efficiency there, so maybe that's the cheaper way to go. Um, they also did not say that no, that they could not do some sort of tower element coming off. They've done like cupolas and things right. like that in other prefab rental buildings. So um, again, we should be able to get that type of information to understand, but we want to try to maintain that climbing functionality. Right. And the only compromise that we could be coming back to you and just saying is when we looked, looked at what the overall additional cost would be to raise the whole thing to 30 feet or 35 feet to get your full climbing height in. Um, if whatever that dollar value is, if we came down to just provide a height that served the shop spaces primarily to make sure they have enough clearance to get equipment in and out, um, what that savings would be. And at that point, you just would not have an interior environment that allowed you to competition. So something else just to keep in mind in that is could you do a, not split. two level, but split. So the first third or two or half is, is at one height, then the back half is, mm -hmm. you yep. might have one classroom in shot higher. Mm -hmm. um, yep. It might have to flip maybe where the garages are, but you know that might save us too. Yeah. So I, we'll, we're going to obviously go down this path with the free right. capital building. I think so. We're going to reach out to a manufacturer, and we'll, they're a little bit more challenging to get to talk to because I guess they're just in demand. Uh, but we'll be persistent, and hopefully we'll get an avenue of communication where we're not having to pay somebody to precon working for us. So that they're in, they're in such demand shows the environment of the the industry Correct. that people are going that route because they're affordable. Yes. Can I uh, just reiterate as you're mentioning all these kind of trade-offs that you're looking at that um, I'm a little skeptical of cutting out those two corners I think you should still keep it on the table, finding a way to keep those, just because I think it sets up the, the department for for the future better, having those spaces, and I think that the um, the impact of the budget just isn't going to be a one-to-one -one trade off. You're going to lose a lot of functionality for not saving a bunch of money. I think at the end of the day, I mean, the numbers that Helen put up there, you could see we're still not down to 6.3, which nope. is where we need to be. Um, so there's there's additional thinking that we're going to need to do, additional approaches that we're going to need to find to bridge that final gap, if all those numbers actually are validated by our cost estimators. So that, that's a big step that we also have to make. He's just been on vacation for two weeks, right? He finished the estimate, and then he was away. So we're waiting for him to get back anxiously, and then we're going to press him to get some. So you use Fogarty regularly, I'm guessing, and maybe one, two other Correct. It's, companies? Yeah. It's so what's his track record been on, on when it comes in to bid or however negotiated? How has his estimate matched up with the reality? I think they're generally um, on par with where we can get you the exact figures for where it is, but it's really just AM Fogarty is the one is one of the ones that we trust, and then PM and C, and it's really those two estimators in the state that we work with on every single project, and it's usually a combination of the OPM hiring the other one when we do comparative estimates. So we have a lot of faith in them in particular. I will say, um, and I mentioned this morning to Andy as well, that um, on the design bid build projects, the straight 149 projects, we have been seeing recently that most of them have been, been coming in at or, or even under budget as versus the 149 ACM at risk, which always seem to grow a little bit because that's just their nature. Um, it, it's tough to bank on that. We're not going to put it in the estimate right, that we right. can get bid savings, but I think the competition is out there in the market right now. Um, people are trying to get the work, um, and so that's, I think, what has been driving a lot of the bid pricing when they're hard bid down. So we're hopeful on that front. Um, that it's that we're catching the market at, at a good time relatively um, to versus the opposite where things would be coming in a little bit. Could you bring up the slide that had the three prefab? Sure. You're that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can. Oh, so we it gets tired during the course of these meetings and just. Oh, too far. See, heavy hands there. Oh, handy that's yeah, that's um, yeah. So not scientifically done with respect to the markups, I will say. Um, you know, the so markup structure is twenty percent. And forward uses twenty percent. So. So on the the other one, it's not up there. You had oh no, there it is. No, it's the general cost. Rate. I guess that's 
different. For the site work, you have the same costs all the way across the board. Yep. But if we're removing a classroom and the headhouse, mm -hmm. making the building smaller, is mm -hmm. the site work going to get less expensive because we're going to be reducing what we have to do? Yes. But only by a little bit. Yeah, but by a little bit. Well, I didn't know yeah. how much, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're taking a, you know, it's 20 by 20. Do all the infrastructure yes. and that, right. and it's, unless you really take a big chunk away. Well, I was looking at, you know, you, you had the cost because you're bringing in all the fill and building up, and if you're going to be taking away, you know, a quarter of the building, mm -hmm. yeah. isn't that going to reduce it by 100,000, 150,000? I don't know, compared to 1.4 or whatever, whatever that was. Right. It, it'll reduce it, but I think to Tom's point, it won't be proportional to, yeah. you know, Okay. Um, the only trade-off, uh, yeah, totally the site work was assuming that we were demoing the existing building, which would give more the roadway, parking lot, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So if we don't take down what we have existing, it may impact some of the site design. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's a benefit or not, I don't know yet. But. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And the Berkshire Design Group hasn't had the opportunity yet to we're meeting with them tomorrow to kind of absorb, you know, the general direction we're headed. So, just while we're on this slide, uh, we haven't taken it here, but I think back to James's question about whether or not the prefab metal building can be erected more quickly. I would feel comfortable at least taking, say, a month off of general conditions multiplier, mm -hmm. assuming that there is a metal building showing up on site. Could be more than that, but I think that would be a conservative assumption that we could make. Oh, that's, that's realistic. Yeah. I was just curious more for like our benefit for calendar time, you know, mm -hmm. this is like a quicker, like it's taken us to this point, we have a little bit of a snag, which we have to kind of find a way through, is there some benefit to that in keeping us on schedule or mm -hmm. you know, being ahead of schedule? It would help mm -hmm. there too. Yeah. Or if you were going to build it and attach it to that building, would that help with timing so like you could do rehab of what's left over the summer, mm -hmm. you know, and still be on schedule that benefits all the kids using it. Yeah. Just because I didn't know if like building it next to what we have left, if that's better with all the site stuff, because we don't have to change a major part of campus. I, I have no idea. You guys know that better, even if we have the Exxon Valdez buried beneath. You know. <laughs> um. yeah. yeah, there's the remediation consideration yeah. for that. Yeah. Yeah. And then also just you know, the um, moving towards a master plan for campus, right? Like moving off of that site. I think we all recognize this committee and recognize the benefit to that. So yeah, I think moving that direction will free you up um, also in the future. <coughs> Um, I do have the schedule at the very end, but we did want to kind of review um, some of the life cycle cost uh, analyses that were done on the systems that were considered. Oh, all right. Here, take this. <laughs> no, I can just take you over there. It's fine. No, I know. Just get away from me. <laughs> Really quickly on the, the concept here. So life cycle cost analysis is, it's an overall assumption, it's actually a, a code requirement um, that we have to study this for the mechanical systems on any project that we're doing over a certain dollar threshold. Um, and what the, what the overall concept is, is that we look at not just the first cost of whatever that system is to be putting in, um, it looks at the operating costs as well in terms of how much you're going to be paying for whatever your chosen fuel or power source is. Um, it also um, incorporates what the replacement and maintenance cost is over the course of 50 years. So a lot of these systems, um, the building may be designed for 50 years, but some of these systems don't have that lifespan. So you do need to plan on replacing them at a certain point. And that's what um, this overall number that we look at, the uh, life cycle cost analysis value uh, really incorporates into it. So, um, what you see at the top is really sort of the, the punchline to the entire process is that um, through the review, and, and we looked at not just the air source heat pumps, we we're looking at ground source heat pump as well, 
um, which is a geothermal system um, that's directed by our um, HVDC working group. And we also looked at a biomass or a wood pellet fired boiler system for the heating. There would still be a cooling component to that that we can't do through the, the pellet um, fired boiler um, approach. And so, um, up at the top, and oh, we'll get into the numbers on the subsequent slides, but um, the ground source heat pump, heat pump option, again, is $630,000 in additional costs. So that, that's not, again, just first cost. It's not how much. It just costs more than the initial. Um, this is looking over that 50-year um, operation replacement cycle as well. Um, for the wood pellet fire boiler option, um, it was less uh, increase in terms of overall um, life cycle cost um, than the geothermal. Um, but it did not include um, a larger solar PV. So this is tied to the future electrification requirements that's in the energy code right now that you have to provide for some additional infrastructure that's there. So we didn't incorporate the PV um, sizing in there. Um, let me just keep moving on. Uh, just so that you understand uh, what we're shooting for and sort of what the end result is, when we look at the, the EUI, this is the energy use intensity. Um, it's really, it's like your miles per gallon for the building, how efficient it is to operate your building. Um, with the air or the ground source heat pump, we're meeting this range of 25 to 30, which is really prescribed in terms of what a, a sort of net zero energy level and also now uh, mainly uh, energy code compliant building needs to perform at in terms of being able to meet it. Um, and then just the comparison of that in terms of the wood pellet fired boiler, it's a tongue twister, um, it uses more, it has a higher EUI inherently, uh, just in terms of the amount of energy that you have to expend. It's a different type of fuel, and so that's, that's where um, advocacy comes in from it because it can be a renewable uh, resource in terms of the wood coming into it. Uh, but in terms of its efficiency, um, it, is, it is less efficient. Um, even using the highest efficiency boilers that we could find available on the market right now. Um, also, just to point out, in terms of thinking about utility incentives, in terms of how that impacts things, um, ground source heat pump does have a lot of great um, incentives right now that are available from utilities. Um, roughly $100,000 for a project of this size, but in terms of the delta on life cycle cost, um, there's probably about 600,000 delta. So that even though there's good incentives, um, there's going to be overall investment, um, both first cost and sort of long term, that uh, will eclipse that. Um, and just the fact that the wood fire pellet boiler option does not, um, it's not eligible for incentives right now uh, from our utilities. Um, this, is, this is the raw sort of math associated with it. Um, so that's the, the three columns you see the insulation, that's the first cost um, that you see that first um, column. Um, the replacement cost after a certain usable life that's through it, um, as well as the operational maintenance there. And so those, the second two columns, uh, maybe with the exception of the replacement cost for the, the wood-fired boiler, um, relatively similar. A lot of it is in the first cost, especially for the ground source heat pump, which um, just has first cost uh, premiums due to the drilling associated with it. Um, payback uh, associated with um, annual savings. Um, there you can see in terms of this is a relative um, in terms of the years for the ground source heat pump where we are, um, as well as the biomass boiler, um, much longer in terms of payback overall. Um, and then just a, a bit more additional detail on the utility incentives that are available. Um, so the ASHV is air source heat pump, uh, VRF is variable refrigerant flow. So that's, that's again our, our, our baseline um, assumption. And the reason that we put it in there um, to start off with, that's our baseline assumption, is just we know from different project um, experience that it, it is always going to be the lowest cost, first cost, and life cycle cost analysis approach. Um, and it's why we started there. We honestly do not have any sort of preference to it. Um, we think that there's a lot of value to the other systems, but there's, there are premiums associated with it. And we're just at a point right now where it's difficult to consider any premiums in terms of where our overall project budget picture is. Um, we're sort of looking for savings opportunities. 
So, if there's any big picture questions on the life cycle cost analysis, again, it, a code required, so we have to go through that process. Um, we just know it's it's a little bit of a challenging discussion right now to have when we have sort of a bigger budget cloud hanging over us. So the next steps, um, we're going to keep working, um, looking at various options, um, shrinking the building, changing heights, um, you know, and continuing to kind of keep them all comparative um, and working with our cost estimator. We will be back next week working with Andy and James and Mark, make sure we don't drop something essential. Um, and then, as Andy mentioned at the outset, the goal would be to make sure you know we get some direction from the board of trustees, and it's a month. Um, just one additional V option, because again, we're not down to where we need to be. Um, something yeah. that we've talked through so far, and we haven't gone back to actually quantify it, but we may need to, um, is the notion of not probably the shell of the building or the structure, especially if it's prefab, but thinking about some portion of the interior fit up of the building as being done by some of the trades here at the school. Um, not to put more work on Tim, that's not the, the vision for it, but it would st we still need to buy the materials, um, but in terms of the labor that's there, um, if there could be some savings that are there. And it doesn't come without impact um, to the project schedule, uh, most likely. Um, and it's certainly, uh, right, and it's, it, it'll bring it up other challenges, but again, we're at this point we're trying to look under every stone that we can to find opportunities for savings, and don't know yet whether it has to be uh, part of the solution. We certainly would prefer it not to be part of the solution, but uh, just so it's out there for consideration. So no one is here surprised if we come back in a month and say this is something that we may need to consider to get on budget. Okay. Just briefly the, the schedule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yes, you should. <laughs> um, so this has been um, updated a bit. Um, we actually have um, completed all of the site investigations. I think as this, um, earlier this month, the stormwater test fits were done. Um, and the results looked good. I don't have the report yet from um, Berkshire Design Group, but again, that might also impact some of this work that we're trying to do um, in, in lessen the costs. Um, so, assuming that we do get some positive direction, momentum forward on um, the 14th of November, um, so you know, just kind of playing out the schedule um, from there, um, you know, kind of puts us in early March as being um, ready to go ahead. In there too, we'll have some permitting that, that we're going, going to need to get going, um, and I believe um, we are going to want to get. Concom out in the fall um, before the snow flies to make sure that um, the Concom officer agrees with the wetlands as have been delineated by um, by the consultant. Um, so again, we don't want to, we can't just stop. We're kind of far enough along. We do want to make sure that nothing, we don't let anything stop that's going to affect us further down the line. We will be, again, estimating through the process um, as we go, just to make sure we stay on target. Whatever that target ends up being defined as. So again, from the high level, if we had the board vote on the 14th of November, where they feel comfortable with the potential budget and meeting the timeline, uh, even if that happens, this schedule being tight, we could hopefully finish June of 25, correct? Yes, because if we'll we be choose, about, yeah. if we choose to say, you know, we really want to investigate more, we want to see if we can get more money so we can get closer to that 12 million, and you know, let's give us another six months, so we hit the pause button until next summer. Then what happens? Push, put everything pushes out by the same number of months. I think. I think it would be great if there is a plan for additional fund raising that targets be set and we can definitely continue to develop the project and consider alternates. Um, you know, public bids. Point, perhaps the, the fundraising might be to satisfy, back to your first question, what, your mm -hmm. earlier question, what do we do with the existing building? If that's the path that we go, 
that might be a way to also find maybe some more money to, to revitalize the, the existing building. Uh, I just fear, I, honestly, I, I do fear if, if we prolong this beyond the November 14th meeting, we're going to be up against it to get the building done. And even though I just bought us another year with a grant, it still has to get done by that June 25. Right. Um, that's three and a half million of the six million dollar budget that we lose. Okay. So okay. escalation does continue to roll <laughs> yeah. as well. So the longer you wait, unfortunately, the more expensive it becomes to build what you want to build. Yeah. Small clarification. So does the project have to be finished by that June 25 date, or that money has to be spent by June 25? It has to be spent. Yes. But now, from the eyes of the state, is spending and completion are either the same thing or two different things. Um, it would be great if they were two different things. It would be nice. <laughs> that would give us a few more months. Correct. Yeah. How did that create a videographer yeah. out here or whatever? He was, what is the term? Is that the correct thing? Yes. Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago? Yes. Yep. Have you seen a product? From not, yet. not yet. Not yet. Not he's, yet. Okay. he's got editing to do, but um, we're pushing on. Had a great day out here. Got some great footage. Of okay. Students, have you seen something in a rough form, Ellen? I have not. I've seen one Clip. awesome <laughs> interview, which if I can pull it up, I'll show it to you with. Uh, I can't remember the student's name. Talking about how great you were. <laughs> um, we're we'll, we'll continue to push Lucas on getting some a rough cut soon. But yes, we absolutely had always assumed that that would help with um, okay. making the case for funds. All right. I just want to weigh in really quick yeah. on the pre on your been thinking about your prefab deposit question. Um, Number one, I know that the Parks and Rec Department recently did a prefabricated building, so I want to look into what their RFQ looked like, and I think there might be specific provisions under procurement law regarding prefab versus regular construction, so that's my one piece of homework for me. On the deposit piece, I think it really comes down to, um, like, a municipality just cannot pay for goods or services unrendered, like I said. I think a lot of it comes down to communicating with the vendor, how that's non-negotiable for us, but communicating that we're a municipality, this is a public school, we're good for the money. We're not gonna go bankrupt. It's not like a lot of those like deposits are operating the private sector as I understand. So a lot of it is like helping them understand if you engage with a prefab vendor, say, hey, we're a municipality, we're good for the money. We know this deposit exists in regular business world, but that's one of the realities we're existing in. So can you make an exception and talking that through with them? <clears throat> I hate to rain on your parade, but that won't happen. Right. We run into that all the time. Yeah, these are totally. all totally. We get a specialized air handling unit for a million two. Mm -hmm. They aren't going to even start making it until I give them $400,000. Understood, yeah. So I think it's really tough. They need to go, and you're yeah. going to find that, that that is going to be a battle you won't win. And in that case, I think some, I think Tom, you kind of alluded to this finding a way where we're actually paying for an actual service instead well, it's of in stored materials. Correct. In exactly. The, in the some, there's some a way around it, but, but you won't get them to forgive it. I just wanted to give you something to work with if you need to speak with these vendors between now and when I get back to your question, Andy. And then one other thought is, I wonder if some of these prefab vendors might be on a cooperative purchasing contract, like Sourcewell, for instance or something like that, that could potentially streamline um, that side of the procurement worth looking into. What direction were you looking for from us for your next meeting? I wanted to see if tomatoes were coming out to be known at me, <laughs> if there was at least a general receptive, yeah, the money's tight, but this might be the, the good option. I just want to get a feeling from all of you. So when I stand in front of the board tonight, I'm sure the board's going to ask, "What well, has the building going to be built?" So, um, you know, what are your thoughts? My personal feeling is nothing wrong with a prefab building. My office is prefab when we built it. Yeah, they right blew up a lot faster. You went on the Kirby website, and they don't. You can't you can do just building, about anything. There's building. a lot of different metal manufacturers out there, so it's not like you have to look at just one. Right. You know. 
uh, every cost estimate for every project we've gotten lately has been jaw-dropping and shocking, so I wasn't shocked at all by this. I was actually very impressed by the fact that Prefab gets us in the ballpark. I mean, there's still some trimming to be done, but I was impressed at, at how much that brought it down into reach. So, Get by it. all means. <laughs> with a big caveat that this was this yeah. was done based on our conversations with a uh, fabricator that works in Connecticut, New Hampshire. New Hampshire yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll have to validate it, but yep. it, it'll move us in the right direction for sure. Right. So that I did. I'll throw out now that we're sort of off the record now. Uh, <laughs> you know, the figures that he was giving us, just for the basic base model, and if we're not and we're not talking fitting out the interior for the classrooms, but just the building itself. Base, base, base is thirty to thirty-five dollars a square foot. He thinks, based on our use, he would probably estimate more in the sixty-dollar uh, per square foot range, and that would be including the insulated metal panels. Uh, so, even if that's somewhere in a ballpark, sixty dollars a square foot, and then how much is it going to be for the plumbing and electrical and construction in the interior? That's where we start getting up into that three hundred dollars square foot range, anyhow. Uh, you know, and while I, I like the plan and the concept you guys came up with, and I like the wood and everything, it, at the end of the day, and I want to speak for Jim, if we have a functional building that's going to fit our needs, I don't care that much what it looks like. Um, yes, I do. But in the end, if it's going to get us what we need so that we can well, keep the, and have the program moving forward for the next 50 years um, and be the right size and have the right space set up and whatnot, then I'm okay with it. I don't know. I don't want to speak for him, but, you know. It would have been fabulous to have the CLT structure and the wood and especially well, for Maybe, maybe we could have Carpentry build a, like, Wooden covers to go over the metal beams. So it looks like we have the wood inside, but yeah, cabinet yeah. There you go. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know we still get that wood metal wall that you rip out. You know. Yes, any and all. This type of construction is suitable for a, a shop. Space. Just come down the industrial park, and you know, ninety-nine percent of those buildings are all prefab. Yeah. But there's three or four vendors locally that deal in prefab buildings. Associated Builders out of South Hadley, Kiter has got a star franchise. There's there's plenty of them right in the valley. Mm -hmm. Morris used to handle one, but he just closed up shop after so. 75 years. But there's two or three, four vendors that are local that's, that would bid on something like this. That's interesting. It might make for a more competitive bid environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong going awesome. down that route. Yeah. Your building was going to be beautiful the way it was designed, but hey, we got to face reality. Beautiful doesn't pay the bill. Yeah. Wrapping up for now. Yes. Yeah. Anything else?